Billy Graham is a, is a real puzzle to me. Uh, in 1948, uh, he said, the evangelical church faces three major enemies, communism, Catholicism, and Mohammedanism, by that he meant Islam. Uh, by 1952, he had turned around completely, was saying that his beliefs were basically the same as those of Orthodox Roman Catholics. Uh, any converts going forward in a Billy Graham crusade Catholics are sent back to the Catholic Church, thousands, tens of thousands. I have files with Bishop so-and-so from this city, Bishop so-and-so from that city, uh, in newspapers saying the greatest thing that could happen is a Billy Graham crusade. That's how we get all the lapsed Catholics back into the church, saying that Billy Graham would never say anything against our, uh, the church, the Catholic Church. Billy Graham received an honorary doctorate, for example, uh, from Belmont uh, Abbey, uh, Belmont uh, College, uh, which was a, Je a Jesuit school, and in the acceptance speech he said, the gospel that built this school and the gospel that I preach are one and the same. Billy Graham has met uh, with the Pope five times, at my last count. Uh, he has had in-depth, by his own uh, uh, confession, he, in his autobiography, for, in his autobiography, for example, he's had in-depth discussions in the Vatican with their theologians. He's, he spent a week in the Vatican on, on one occasion. Uh, he's had in-depth discussions with the Pope. And yet, he says on, a, on the Larry King Live program, for example, and, and on other occasions, Billy Graham said, uh, the Pope and I agree on almost everything. And any differences we have are not important theologically. Uh, Billy Graham uh, is a great friend of the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, he praises, for example, uh, the nearest thing to a, a televangelist that the Catholic Church ever had was Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. And his videos are still, you know, he's dead now, but his videos are still in circulation. And uh, you will find in the ads in major magazines, newspapers, there's an endorsement by Billy Graham, uh, who calls Fulton Sheen, he says, the greatest communicator of this century. Well, he was a great communicator, but of a false gospel. Um, <clears throat> Billy Graham is called the Pope, the greatest religious leader of the century. On Larry King Live, for example, uh, Larry King said, um, Billy, how do you feel about other, and he's struggling for the term uh, denominations or churches, what he didn't quite come out with. He says, like, like the Mormons and the Catholics, uh, Billy Graham said, oh, I think I have a wonderful fellowship with all of them. And Larry King says, you have no problem with Salt Lake City, with the Vatican? Billy says, oh, the Pope and I are the best of friends. In fact, when he was made Pope in Rome, I was preaching in his cathedral in Krakow, Poland. Uh, in fact, on that occasion, Billy was preaching and had preached in four Catholic cathedrals in Poland. Now, you know that he's not saying anything that would upset the Catholics, or they're not going to have him there. He went to Jasna Gora because this is the, the Black Virgin, the protectress of Poland, which was the favorite of the Pope. And he greeted the pilgrims there and complimented them, you know, and what a wonderful thing uh, it was and so forth. Billy went on on the Larry King Live program. He said, in fact, when the Pope came to South Carolina, he invited me to be on the platform with him. He would give one talk and I would give the other. But I was halfway to China, Billy, Billy said. And then Larry King said, well, uh, what about Judaism? And Billy says, oh, I mean, I've been up to the rabbinical council. Uh, you know, we have our friendly discussions. And Rabbi Tannenbaum, who was a good friend of all of us, I relied on, I relied on him spiritually, theologically, f for his counsel in every way. You can imagine the Apostle Paul. They say, how do you get all the rabbis? Oh, fine. I go up to Sanhedrin and they have me all the time. And Rabbi Gamaliel? I mean, I rely on him theologically, spiritually, in every way. And it gets a little bit worse. But finally, Larry King said, Billy, it's halftime at the Super Bowl. You got 30 seconds. What would you say? Greatest opportunity he ever had to preach the gospel. And I'm not denying Billy preaches the gospel. On some occasions he does, but he also compromises. 
Billy said, I would tell them to think about another game, the game of life, and to be sure they're on God's side. And he will answer their prayers if they will make that commitment to him. No cross, no Christ, no gospel, no salvation. Billy Graham, of course, was the first evangelical to accept the Templeton Award for progress in religion. John Mark Templeton is one of the most um, clever anti-Christians. He's an occultist, uh, science of mind, and so forth. He's a very wealthy Wall Street money manager. And, uh, but he believes you're God, I'm God, everything is God. Uh, the Bible is not the word of God. All religions are equally valid, but they're all equally wrong. And what we need is a new religion uh, that um, uh, is scientific, that would be acceptable to all religions on this earth and to all extraterrestrials out there as well, and is not dependent upon ancient manuscripts like the Bible. Although he was 15 years on the board of managers of the American Bible Society. Uh, he was had two terms, six years as chairman of the board of the Princeton Theological Seminary, and the man does not believe uh, the, the Bible. You create your own reality with your mind. Heaven and hell are in your mind. You make your own heaven and, and your own hell. Uh, this man is as bad as you can get. And now he, what he's working for is the new world religion, obviously, of the Antichrist. And he says, to encourage progress toward the establishment of this religion, I have founded the Templeton Award for Progress in Religion. You couldn't possibly accept that. No evangelical could accept that. We don't believe that Christianity, for example, is a religion. Furthermore, it doesn't change. You don't make progress in Christianity. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The truth doesn't change. Billy Graham accepted the award. You read of it in his autobiography, and he's just so pleased and thrilled. Uh, Charles Colson accepted the award. Charles Colson gave his, his, his acceptance speech at the 1993 Parliament of the World Religions in Chicago, and on the platform behind him when he gave his acceptance speech were monks and um, Buddhists and Hindu and Muslim. Uh, and he didn't give them the gospel. <clears throat> it was all sort of um, uh, religiously correct terminology about spiritual awakening and moral values and this kind of stuff. That uh, service was opened by a Muslim chant and closed by a Buddhist uh, prayer. Uh, and this is where Charles Colson gave his acceptance speech. All right. And he praised uh, John Templeton and this award. Bill Bright accepted the award at a Catholic church in Rome. His opening words in his acceptance speech were, Your Eminence, Cardinal Cassidy. Cardinal Cassidy is the leader of the ecumenical movement out of Rome. He is the Pope's ambassador, travels around the world. He is actually the man behind ECT, one and two. Every word had to be ex uh, approved by the Pope through Cardinal Cassidy, okay? Uh, he's the man that put this thing together. And Bill Bright's opening words are, Your Eminence, Cardinal Cassidy. So pleased that he was there. In his acceptance speech, Bill Bright praised John Marks Templeton. What a great man he was. And praised his prize, this award, as the greatest award that could possibly be given. Uh, this is what he had to say about an award for uh, forming the Antichrist world religion. Uh, so this is how the... Uh, ecumenism uh, and compromise has come into the evangelical church. But of course many of the recipients of the Templeton Award were Catholics. Uh, Mother Teresa as I mentioned and, and so forth. Uh, Billy Graham, uh, it's not too hard maybe to understand something about him. Billy Graham for example has accepted theistic evolution. Uh, he says he sees no problem with God having used evolution. Uh, he's, uh, well, there are some problems. The Pope, of course, accepts it. The Catholic Church accepts theistic evolution. So does Promise Keepers. Uh, so has Christianity Today in an editorial. They agreed with the Pope. A basic problem, just real fast with that, is if I can't accept what the Bible says about the origin of man, why should I accept Billy Graham's gospel about the destiny of man? If I can't accept what it says about the the man's fall and separation from God, why should I accept what it says about his reconciliation? 
Adam is, is mentioned about 30 times in 10 books of the Bible. If you pull Adam out, you puncture so many holes in the Bible, it, it's, it can't contain truth. Jesus is called the last Adam. His genealogy is traced back to Adam. Furthermore, uh, Jesus believed in Adam and Eve. He said, for this cause, a man will leave father and mother. And he talked about the, the you know, in, in, in the Bible, the Genesis account. He's not God if, if the Genesis account is wrong. The Bible says, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all of sin. But if these critters have been evolving and dying, evolving and dying, if they were what Cardinal O'Connor recently said, a couple of anthropoid critters that God zapped with the human soul, then death was in this world before sin. And the Bible is wrong on that account also. The Bible says that God created Adam first, and he was here for quite a while, and he, um, uh, named the animals and so forth. God saw that he needed a help meet and he put him to sleep and out of a rib he created a woman. You can't reconcile that with two critters evolving side by side, you know, male and female, and then he zaps them and, and, and here they are. So uh, then Billy Graham has said he's not sure the flood was worldwide. Well, the Bible very clearly says everything died, everything that breathed died, all the mountains were covered. There's no doubt about what the Bible says about it. And, of course, uh, you've never seen a rainbow because uh, you, the rainbow was only a promise that that local flood wouldn't happen again, so you've got to go over to Mesopotamia where the rainbow appears if you want to see a rainbow. And furthermore, we don't have to worry about the world being destroyed by fire because it's likened to the flood. So if it was a local flood, it's a, it's a local fire. Billy Graham recently on Larry King Live, Larry King who's married to a Mormon, so he believes in eternal marriage. I mean, his wife does. I don't know what Larry King believes in. Uh, but Larry King, of course, being interested in the subject, asked Billy Graham if there was sex in heaven. And Billy said, well, if it's essential to our happiness, there will be. Uh, well, it's very clear in the Bible. Jesus says, we're like the angels. We are neither marry nor given in marriage. So if there's sex in heaven, it's got to be extramarital sex. Billy didn't say, it is written. He doesn't stand on the Word of God. I think I can explain why. In his autobiography, he tells you in 1949 he faced a crisis of faith. It nearly shattered his faith. He had been a good friend uh, with um, a Chuck Charles Chuck Templeton, not any relationship to John Marsh Templeton. They had been evangelists together. They had even preached in England together. And Templeton thought that he needed a higher education to be more effective for the Lord, so he went to seminary, uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, which was already apostate, and there he lost his faith. And he communicated to Billy. He said, Billy, there are problems in the Bible. There are contradictions in the Bible. There are unscientific statements in the Bible. There are statements in the Bible that are not psychologically sound, according to modern psychology. And it shook Billy to the core. And Billy had no answers. And he says in his autobiography, I have no answers for this. So he gives you the prayer that he prayed. He says, I got down on my knees and I prayed, God, Chuck has confronted me with, you know, unscientific statements in the Bible, contradictions in the Bible, things that I, I've got no answer for them. But God, I'm going to take it by faith. This is your word. And Billy presents that in his autobiography as though this is a wonderful step of faith. No, it's a leap in the dark. Uh, how would you, if your 18, 19, 20-year-old son or daughter comes home from college and says, Dad, Mom, the uh, professors pointed out some contradictions in the Bible. There are unscientific statements in the Bible. There are things in the Bible that just couldn't be true. What, what am I going to do about it? You say, well, just take it by faith. Look, if there are problems in the Bible, I better face them. And I better find out. If the Bible has contradictions, it's not God's word. If it's got unscientific statements, it's not God's word. So Billy says, on the one hand, well, I just take it by faith. But he doesn't take it by faith. That is a poor foundation because he says, well, maybe the Bible's wrong about Adam and Eve. Maybe the Bible's wrong about the flood, you know, and, and so forth. So I don't know how better to explain what happened to Billy Graham than the fact that he doesn't seem to have a f solid foundation bi biblically. So how do we explain the transition going back to 1948? the three major enemies of the evangelical church, communism, Catholicism, and Mohammedanism. And then the change <clears throat> that came about in Billy Graham. It was somewhere around 1950, uh, that, or maybe a little bit before, that um, Billy went to Bernard Baruch. Uh, 
Most people are too young to remember Bernard Baruch. He was the genius that made money in the 1929 stock market crash. So he became the counselor to presidents. And Billy Graham consulted him, I'm sure, with the best of motives. How can I become well known? I'm sure he wanted to get the gospel out to more people. Bernard Baruch said, I'll put in a good word for you with my two friends, John Randolph Hearst and Claire Booth Luce. John Randolph Hearst had the Hearst newspapers across the country. Claire Booth Luce, Life, Time, and Look magazines. And I saw Billy Graham years later when they asked him, uh, to what do you attribute your great success? He said, John Randolph Hearst. Hearst put out the word Puff Graham. And the newspapers began to do this across the country. Billy Graham became famous. It so happens that John Randolph Hearst and Claire Booth Lewis were big Catholics. And I can't explain his, the transition from saying Catholicism is the great enemy to becoming the friend. Now, there are other ways. Uh, Cardinal Cushing, for example, at Boston, Billy Graham tells in his autobiography. He says how they became wonderful friends. Oh, he became a wonderful friend of, of uh, Fulton J. Sheen and so forth. And Billy Graham says this insightfully. I mean, I don't know if he knows what he's saying, but when he talks about his wonderful friendship with Cardinal Cushing, he says, that was my first coming to grips with the evangelical Catholic problem. <laughs> well, he didn't come to grips theologically, but it was because he loved these people, you know, and, and if I had, well, I shouldn't say this. I mean, who am I to say to Billy Graham? But if Billy Graham were sitting here and I could say one thing to him, I would say, Billy, you might go to the Gospel of Luke where Jesus says, Woe to you when all men speak well of thee, for so they spake of the false prophets that were before you. I saw Billy on the David Frost show. And uh, David Frost says, well, how do you feel about Catholics? How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? And, and Billy just, you know, everybody. He's in fellowship with everybody. He praises the enemies of the gospel. He praises Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus and, and, and everybody. He praises um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who was, uh, you know, a womanizer and denied the, the deity and the virgin birth and everything. Had him speak to his staff, open in prayer at a, at a crusade and so forth. And, and finally, David Frost is a little astonished. He says, is there anybody you don't like? Billy says, I love them all. <laughs> so it seems to me that his motive has been to be well-liked, maybe for good reasons, so that he could get the gospel out uh, to more people. But it has created tremendous compromise. Now that, I don't blame entirely on Billy Graham, but maybe on those who are his, um, what would you call them? Uh, his guides, or, or not mentors, but uh, his handlers, uh, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Um, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I was having lunch with a pastor in Philadelphia, I think it was, or somewhere around there, and I was talking about the Albigenses, the Valdenses, the Bogum Mills, and, and so forth, the Qatari, who the Catholic Church for a thousand years before the Reformation they slaughtered the real Christians by the millions. And he said, well, where do you get that information? I said, well, if you're not going to get it out of your encyclopedia. Look it up in your encyclopedia. They'll tell, them, tell you that these were um, Manichaeans. They believed in a good God and a bad God. They were in a ritual suicide. They were immoral and so forth. These are the false accusations of the inquisitors. They didn't tell the truth about them. They lied about them to burn them at the stake, OK, and to slaughter them. Uh, it took the popes about a century to wipe out the Albigensians. At one time, this was the, the, the most prosperous part of the area of Europe, southern France. These were evangelical Christians, and they wiped them out. Uh, uh, the Pope Innocent III, in one crusade, wiped out the entire city of Béziers, 60,000 people, including women and children. Uh, these were Albigensians, evangelical Christians. They, they wiped out the, or chased out, they, they killed almost 300,000 Huguenots. I was in South, um, South Africa, and I met Huguenot descendants down there, and the rest of them fled, about a half a million. Uh, and so I, he said, well, where would I find this information? Well, I said, why don't you pull Fox's Book of Martyrs off of your shelf? And he said, well, I don't have a copy. Well, I said, look it up in... Um, Halley's Pocket Bible Handbook. Oh, he says, I've got one of those. So he pulled it off the shelf, 
and he looked in the index, he says, well, there, there's no Albigenses listed here. There's no Valdenses listed here. Oh, I said, I can explain that to you. You either have a 1962, a 1964, or a 1969 Billy Graham Crusade Special Edition of Halley's Pocket Bible Handbook. They received permission, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association received permission to, from the Halley family to publish a special crusade edition uh, of the pocket handbook, Bible handbook, and they took out everything that Halley had so carefully researched of the evil of the popes, the slaughter of the Albigenses, the slaughter of the real Christians, and you got to do a lot of work to do that. You got to change the, the, every page number uh, and every page number in the, in, in the index and so forth, and I think that's wicked. And I think people ought to know about it. And I hope anybody that's watching me now, call them on the phone or write to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association in Minneapolis, and you ask them why they did it. And why don't you write to Billy Graham and ask him as well. This is robbing people of facts, of history, that they ought to have in order to pacify a church so that you don't say anything against them. But in not saying anything against them, you are suppressing the truth. And I don't think that's right.